I'd like to uh, direct your attention to Isaiah chapter 8 as we continue to consider the increase of the kingdom of God as it is being revealed to us in the book of Isaiah, the good news of Isaiah, you might say the gospel of Isaiah. And we truly are in a place of good news as we direct our attention to the second half of chapter 8 into chapter 9 verse 7, but I warn you that uh, the good news comes at the end. First, we have to go through the bad news, and the bad news is what we begin with in chapter 8, verse 9. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you, I invite you to turn there with me and uh, to, to direct your attention to verses 9 and following. If you don't have your Bible, please feel free to take a pew Bible, and I'd like to invite you to stand now for the reading of God's Word. Be broken, you peoples, and be shattered. Give ear, all you far countries. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling on both houses of Israel." a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony. Seal the teaching among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts, who dwells on Mount Zion. And when, and when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? To the teaching and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry, and when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, but they will be thrust into thick darkness. And now the good news, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us... A child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, it moves us. It moves us because of what it means 
what it meant to Jerusalem and Judah long ago, what it means to your people today. It is the gospel. A gospel which is clear and true, is honest with us about the situation that we find ourselves in, but also honest and clear and abundant in proclaiming your grace and your steadfast love in the midst of our difficulty, in the midst of our rebellion, in the midst of our disobedience. You love us still. Help us, Lord, to be a people that never graduates from the gospel, but continues to go back to it again and again and again, to hear it proclaimed in order that our hearts might melt and that we might be shaped and fashioned by it and by the one who made it possible, even the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his life as a ransom for many. He is the one the child that was promised long ago, who did come. And may his government increase. May his kingdom be forever. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Finally, Caesar arrives at the Rubicon small little river that divides Gaul from Italy. Caesar gathers his one legion around him. Remember that a legion is comprised of 6,000 men. Pompey has 10 legions and the support of the Senate. He is the enemy of Caesar, but Caesar is undaunted by these odds. Suddenly, impulsively, Caesar crosses the Rubicon and cries out, alia yakta est. The die is cast. He crosses the Rubicon only to find that his enemies have fled He chases Pompey around the Mediterranean. Finally, he arrives in Alexandria, where the king of Egypt, Ptolemy XIII, presents him with a gift, the head of Pompey. The die is cast. Caesar crosses the Rubicon. He is pursuing his enemies against great odds. There is no turning back now. The die is cast, a phrase which has come to mean, as you and I know, we've heard it before, no turning back now. This is really the place that we find ourselves in Isaiah chapter 8. Verses 9 and following. The die is cast. There's no turning back now. It's been five years since Uzziah passed away. Uzziah, who was a good king in Jerusalem. Isaiah had the vision on, in the year that Uzziah died of Jesus, of the Lord, the king, the one who is the ruler of all the world. Jerusalem, Judea, Israel, all the world. Isaiah has a vision of him. His glory fills the temple. But it's been five years. It doesn't seem as though that glory is permeating out of the temple and among the people. Ahaz is now king. And there is a rival power that is rising in the north. Assyria is rattling its saber Israel and Syria are afraid. They're looking to Judah, their brothers in the south, to lend support. Ahaz wants nothing to do with it. In fact, Ahaz is secretly hoping that he can make an alliance with Assyria, that Assyria will act favorably towards him. Isaiah goes to him, 
the washer's field. God directs him to go. And he speaks a word of revelation to Ahaz. Don't worry about this burnt out fire, this spent fire called Israel and Syria. They are burnt out. They will not prevail, and I will protect you from Assyria if you stand firm in faith. Isaiah goes on, offers Ahaz an amazing gift. Ask for a sign. It can be as low as Sheol. It can be as deep as the grave. Or it can be as high as heaven anywhere. It's a Hebraism. As low as Sheol, as high as heaven, and anything in between. The whole totality of it all. Ask anything you want. And it will be given to you as a sign of Yahweh's loving kindness, of his power, of his support for his people. And then we come to it. Ahaz makes a decision. He's unwilling to stand firm in his faith. He's unwilling to ask for a sign. He uses pious language to disguise his disobedience. Far be it from me to ask the Lord for a sign. I don't want to put the Lord to the test. The die is cast. God responds by giving a sign of judgment Mehar Shalal Hashbaz, that son whose name means quick to the spoil, swift to the plunder. Assyria will come. Assyria will destroy your brothers to the north. He will take them off the map. Assyria will come and they will flood Judah and they will come all the way up to your neck. The die is cast, but I am with you. It will be a son. His name is Emmanuel. It will be a sign of my ongoing presence and grace and power in your life. You see, after the decision, there's always consequences. After any decision, there is the result. You and I know this from our own experience. We make a decision, and then there are the consequences, either good or bad. The die is cast. There's no turning back now. The text for today begins to detail the result of Ahaz and Judah's decision to not trust Yahweh. I'm not going to ask for a sign. I'm not going to stand firm in faith. I'm not going to look to the Lord. I'm going to look to myself. The die is cast. And so there are consequences. And Israel, Judah, Ahaz, they must live with the consequences. A number of consequences that are a result of this decision. Let me share with you a number of them that are revealed for us in the text. The first is this. God... After the decision that is made by Ahaz, ratified by Judah, God then reasserts himself as God. I am the Lord. I am God. I am the king. Trust in me. They say no. And God comes back and says, I'm still the king. I'm still the Lord. I am still Yahweh. And so God pronounces judgment on the nations. If you have your Bibles open, look, Isaiah chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. Be broken, you peoples, and be shattered. Give ear, all you far countries. Listen to me, Israel. Listen to me, Syria. Listen to me, Assyria. Strap on your armor. Go ahead. You will be shattered. God says it twice, just for emphasis. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand. I am the Lord. 
I'm in charge. God reasserts himself as God. God alone is the global superpower. God alone is the local superpower. Judgment. But God is kind. God is with us. Isaiah says. And so the second consequence after this decision is that God reassures his people. He reassures that he is going to secure his promise by use of a remnant. The remnant's been here all along, humming in the background. Remember, back in chapter 7, when Isaiah goes to Ahaz, he's told to bring his son with him, Sheer Jashub, which means a remnant shall return. God's people will prevail because God is in charge. And Ahaz has rejected God. Judah has rejected God. But God is going to mete out his promises. He is going to be faithful to his word. God remains with us, and he is happy to work with small forces. He's done it before. When the entire world was filled with a population whose hearts were only and always and continually set on evil, God saw one man. His name was Noah. He allowed his favor to rest upon him, him and his family. And they spent a long, long time building an ark, and God preserved through a remnant. Against the great forces of God's judgment, God worked with small forces, with a remnant, and preserved the people in order to build and to make a people who are holy and blameless in his sight. God worked with all the nations in the world. He looked, and there was one man. His name was Abraham. And he called him out. He said, I want you to listen to me. I'm going to make you as numerous as the stars. You're just one man. You and your wife, Sarai, you don't have any children. But I am going to bless you and multiply you. You are small now. You're a remnant among all the nations. But I'm going to give you a a people. and I'm going to give you a name. People will know your name. I'm going to give you a land. A land flowing with milk and honey that can occupy Be occupied by the people. And through you, through your family, through this small little people, I am going to bless the world. God delights to work with small forces. He looks at Israel as they have multiplied in Egypt, as they have grown and grown and grown, and he sees there one man, Moses, he speaks to him in a burning bush. He says, I'm going to use you, Moses. No, 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 not me. I I don't speak well. I'm not very good in crowds. No, it's you. I'm going to raise you up, and I'm going to allow my great power to flow through you, small as you are in order to release my people. God delights to use small things, small forces. Samuel goes and looks for the new king. Israel had enjoyed the stature, this tall, broad-shouldered man by the name of Saul, a king you could really look up to, this giant man whose heart was not after God. So God said, I want you to go. Find me my new king. I'll tell you who he is. Go to Jesse's house. Look to all the brothers. Samuel looks. Is this the one? Nope, not him. Is this the one? Nope, not him. Is there anybody left? Well, just the runt of the family. This small little guy, David, who's out in the fields. Bring him in. He is the one. The 
consequences of disobedience is that God reasserts himself as God and he does not leave his people. He delights, he's happy, he will work with small forces, he will work with small numbers in order to accomplish his promise and he'll do it again. God now begins to make distinctions. The third consequence, distinctions between the obedient And the disobedient. You see, God has tremendous zeal for obedience. God has tremendous zeal for obedience. Look at chapter 8, if you have your Bibles open still. Consider verse 11. For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me. And warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that the people call conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. God's strong hand, his zeal was upon Isaiah, and he says with strength, with force, Don't be like the rest of Judah, don't be like the rest of your kindred in Jerusalem. Don't fall into their trap. The people of faith and obedience must be distinct from the world, from the unbelieving world. A people of faith and obedience must be distinct even within the holy city of Jerusalem. A remnant will not be like Israel. A remnant will not be like Judah. The church if you will, must not be like the world. God has a zeal for the church. The strong hand of the Lord is upon the church, the people of God, to be distinct. The world, it engages in conspiracy. Do you know what's going on over here? Have you heard what's going on? I heard this. This is coming down the line. You should wait. It's coming. It'll be here. The world trades in fear and in dread. God says, not so for my people. His strong hand is upon his church. And he is saying, not my people. Be calm. The people of God, the church, must engage in holiness Devotion to him and to his word alone and to stability in a world that is teeter-tottering at every news report. God makes a distinction between the obedient and the disobedient. The fourth consequence is this. Disobedience results in a crisis of authority. Ahaz rejects God's word. Judah rejects God's promises. And crisis enters into the room. Where do people now go for the truth? They've rejected the one source of truth. They've they've rejected the truth for a lie. And now where are they going to go? You see, God gave himself. He gave signs. He gave sons. Emmanuel, Shir Jashib, Mehar Shalal Hashbaz, all of the sons that spoke to God's truth and God's power and God's purposes, they are being rejected. So where are we going to go? God now begins to hide his face, not because he's angry. Not because he's rejected his people. He's hiding his face from the house of Jacob so that they might inquire of him. That they might notice that he's not here. That they might feel the gap. In order that they might have an itch that drives them to say, we've got to find the truth. But instead, Judah relies on sources of death. 
Rely on the mediums and the necromancers. Go back to your Bibles and look closely. Verse 18, it says, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwell on Mount Zion. And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? Judah is relying on sources of death. This creates a crisis of authority. This rejection of God's authority turns Judah into a people of duplicity, a people of deceit, a people of idle talk, a people who gossip. They are looking to sources that are dead. Today we might call it cable news and the internet. And it's causing the people of God to talk out of both sides of their mouth as they report on what's going on in the news, as they report on what's going on in the internet. They become a people of duplicity. They become a people of idle talk. Lots of talk that is fruitless, lifeless, dark. The dark is descending upon Judah. Sourced from places that are dead. No community is immune to this temptation. When there's a crisis of authority, no community is immune to looking wherever they can to try to find some kind of insight. Judah was not immune to it. The church is not immune to it. This church is not immune immune to it. God wants his people to inquire of him, to talk with him, to go back, not to the sources that are dead, but to go back to his word, his testimony, his truth, which is the truth, once and for all delivered to the people of God. Where are we going to go? In this day and this age, when there is so much chirping and so much murmuring. Remember, this was written even before we had a thing called Twitter that chirped. (laughs) So much chirping and murmuring. Where is the people of God supposed to go? To his word. Go back to his word, to his teaching, to his testimony. Go back to leadership, God is saying. Go to Isaiah and ask him this. Isaiah, what does God have to say? Help us to know the truth. His word is like the light of the dawn. But the die is cast. It's been rejected. And so the final consequence is that the people must live in a land consistent with their desires. Take your Bibles, look at chapter 8, verses 21 and 22. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their face upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, And they will be thrust into thick darkness, for they have rejected the light. Disobedience always leads to distress. The people, as Isaiah describes for us, they will be hungry. And not just physically hungry, morally hungry, starving, spiritually hungry, dying. The people will be hungry, lost in uncertainty and darkness. And the consequence that they are living through will make them 
angry. Have you noticed how angry it is out there? Just angry. All the time. And once angry, their disobedience will lead to blame shifting. This is a phrase of art, a term of art that we've developed in our own family. I don't know if it's used elsewhere. I'm not sure if it's, this is even a good term, but it makes a lot of sense for our family. We talk about blame shifting and not doing that thing. We come confronted with the truth. We want to say, well, that wasn't my fault. That's, well, that's your, it's the kid's fault. It's the kids did that. It's not my fault. Blame shifting. The people are angry and they will hold the king. They will hold God in contempt. This is your fault, king. This is your fault, God. The people must live in a land consistent with their desires. But they will think and they will say out loud, this is really your fault, not my fault. They will look to heaven and they will look to the earth and they will see that they are caught between a rock and a hard place. I don't really like the world that we're living in here. It's not going the way that I want it to. Assyria looks like they're about to crush us, but I look to heaven and I don't really want to submit to that either. And so I'm angry at my situation. And you know what? It's your fault. It's your fault. This is God's description of a world in disobedience, of a people in disobedience, of a church in disobedience. The die is cast. There is no turning back. But God pushes on. God asserts himself as God He meets out his consequences, but he also pushes through the consequences in order to offer grace. We had to get through the bad news in order to get to the good news. To remember that God is giving through Isaiah a vision of salvation. Don't forget all the way back in the first sermon that we preached on Isaiah 1.1 that God is offering a vision of salvation. The whole prophecy of Isaiah, the entirety of the book of Isaiah, all 66 chapters is a vision of salvation. It is a vision now of the kingdom of God. It is a vision of a kingdom of grace. And what God is offering in our text is grace. We have to hear the bad news first, and now we finally come to the good news. But it's a kind of grace that is not necessarily native to our culture. It's a kind of grace that may not necessarily be at home with our modern conceptions of grace. Because grace has kind of taken on a life of its own. Multiplicity of understandings and definitions of what grace is. And some of it is quite understandable because concepts and ideas come together. They get conflated. They get mixed. We confuse grace with the result of grace. Or we confuse grace with something different than grace altogether. I'll give you a few examples very quickly. Thankfulness. We sometimes confuse grace with thankfulness. At every meal, at dinner time. My family and I, we sit down and we say grace. It's very, very short because I like to get to the food. We say, thank you, Lord, for this food. Blessed in Jesus' name, amen. We say grace. But it's really thankfulness. Sometimes we think of grace as a profound feeling of gratitude. Gratitude for what God has done as a result of his grace. John Newton helped us wonderfully by giving an expression of his gratitude in that well-known hymn, Amazing Grace, really is an expression of gratitude as much as it is an expression of grace. Sometimes we confuse grace with patience. I extend grace to my children as I'm trying to teach them how to tie their shoe. But I'm really extending patience. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Confuse that with grace sometimes. God's grace causes him to forgive me, and so when I forgive others, 
I'm offering grace. Well, we may be offering grace, but we're also offering forgiveness. They're not exactly the same thing. Sympathy, putting ourselves in the shoes of others, understanding them, offering them kindness and care. We sometimes think of offering grace, but it's sympathy. Accommodations, grace. It's gracious that we would put on a, a, put a wheelchair ramp here at the church or have our chairlift. And if we were really gracious, we'd put an elevator in here. But we're really accommodating. It's a good thing, but not the same thing as grace. The worst understanding of grace of all is license. Grace, give me grace. Give me permission to do what I want. It's not grace at all. Grace, we know, is unmerited favor. Unmerited favor that does something in us, something specific in us. And so at long last, we finally come to the big idea of the text that in the kingdom of Emmanuel, grace is is unmerited favor that changes our hearts in order that we might find joy in God's way. God pushes through the consequence and he begins to offer grace, which is unmerited favor that changes our heart so that we are rejoicing in God's way in our life. God's law, God's promises, God's purposes, God's kingdom. We see it, our hearts are changed, we embrace it, and we rejoice. Now you might be asking, where are you getting this? Well, it's in the text. This grace, this joy within the limits of God, this rejoicing in God's constraints. Look at verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 1 closely. But there, this is the turn. This is where the gospel comes. You see that gospel, but. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. Who's the her? Isaiah has been having sons. Judah is a man. Who is the her? The her is the remnant. Her is the church. Her is the people of God. But there will be no gloom for her who is anguish. Another way of translating that line is this. There will be no distress for her who was in constraint. The word anguish can also be translated as constraint, which means a casting or a mold into which hot molten metal is poured. Isaiah is giving us a picture, a word picture. Think of a heart, cold and steely, that God begins to melt down. God warms up and begins to melt down, and God is recasting it. You see, the die is cast by God, and the anguish is experienced by those who reject and chafe at the limitations or the constraints or the laws given by God. The chafing and the anger and the frustration is experienced by those who reject the kingdom of Emmanuel. But for those who have encountered grace, as those who have been met by grace, their hearts begin to melt. As they get a vision of Emmanuel as they get a vision of God's remnant, as they get a vision of God's goodness and purpose in their life, their hearts begin to melt. There is no distress for her who is melted down and recast. Grace is a new heart that finds joy in God's kingdom, that finds joy in the constraints. And so let me ask you this, are you distressed? Are you in anguish? Are you resisting the melting? If you want to know joy, then you must yield to God's grace. Do our Christian commitments cause us grief? Or do they cause us joy? 
Do God's constraints in our lives cause us anguish? Ah, oh, I gotta go do that. There's this thing the church is doing. Or do our Christian commitments cause us to exercise our freedom? I get to go do that. Do we delight over the increase of Emmanuel's kingdom in our lives? Or do we find them imposing, limiting? See, God wants us to be a people of grace in order that we might be a people of obedience. And God wants his zeal, his zeal, to be a source for our zeal. That we might zealously minister his grace and walk in steadfast obedience to him. It is the zeal of the Lord of hosts that will do this. In you, in me. As we close this morning, I want to remind you that this has been a season of gloom. It's been a season of anguish. It's been a season of dark times. But Emmanuel is with us. God is offering grace. And I want to encourage you to watch for the dawn. God promises grace. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. The light did shine. On Easter morning. After three days of confinement, three days of constraint, Jesus comes through the open tomb and light comes with us as he ushers in the kingdom of God and he declares, death is dead. Love is one. Christ has conquered. He opens up the joy, or the door of our joy and our freedom. The die is cast. Christ is risen. There's no going back. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for being our king. We thank you that you are Emmanuel. We recognize that there are consequences for our disobedience to you. And you will not be shy. You will not restrain the meeting out of the consequences for disobedience. Because of your grace and your mercy, you allow all of the consequences to fall upon you there at the cross in order that we might be met by grace, in order that we might look to you and by faith stand and say, I am guilty, but he is not, and he took the death that I rightly deserve. Lord, come into my life recast my heart so that I might live for you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.